Hi, everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of Supernova Commencements. I'm Kashi Segal, your host, and we are very excited to have you today. Like always, we have an amazing show. We have someone, our guest today uh, is a specialist at innovation. What the heck is that? We're going to find that out today. Uh, hopefully, he will have all the answers for us. And you know, we do a big data segment on your career and whatever um, the career is that day brought to us by our partners at Stepping Blocks. Innovation is such a innovative thing that there is no category on Stepping Blocks for innovation, but it is made up of a lot of different things. So I want you to watch the segment today and then I want you to head on over to Stepping Blocks and I want you to look it up all the different skill sets that are required and we're going to learn all about all this good stuff product management and all the things so you know what i'm just going to bring our guest on screen uh, because you want to hear from him not from me so let's bring him on scott sanchez how are you hey thanks so much thrilled to be here thrilled to have you okay so like I said, Scott is an expert at innovation. So he was the former chief innovation officer at Nationwide, the insurance company. And he was also VP of innovation at First Data Corporation. So in the wonderful world of fintech, um, he teaches at the D school, the design school, right at, at Stanford. Um, and he's just does all kinds of cool things and um, his brain works in really fabulous ways. So let's just dive straight in. Um, Scott, where did you go to school? Where are you from? So what did you major uh, in? Yeah, awesome. I grew up in Atlanta. I'm actually one of the few native Atlantans that I've ever met, actually, funnily enough. I uh, grew up in Atlanta and I was one of those kids that always took things apart, much to my parents' dismay. So it was pretty clear I was going to be an engineer. Right. So my mom, but my mom framed me and, and sort of named me an engineer who could talk. And so I went off to college thinking, all right, I'm an engineer who could talk. Right. And I thought that was interesting. I went to Princeton and I majored in electrical engineering. You can't spell geek without a double E. That was me uh, without a doubt. And uh, and I thought that's what I was going to be. I really thought I was going to be an engineer who could talk and sort of bridge the gap between engineering and business. And I got to tell you, I couldn't have planned my career getting into this innovation world, but that was a really good background for me to get started uh, in, in what that journey was going to be like. Yeah. Okay. So talking about your journey, what was it? How did you go from school to nationwide? Yeah. So I, um, I actually was fortunate during college to get an internship at AT&T Bell Labs. And if you remember or have heard of AT&T Bell Labs, they were renowned for research, research and development, quote, innovation, if you will. And I was fortunate to get a job there. And so I spent my summers during college working there. And I remember at the end of my senior summer, right before my senior year, I was giving this presentation on uh, AT&T fiber optic ribbon. I, I really was a geek, right? Without a doubt. And I, I was giving this presentation. I even wore a white coat and everything, right? I was one of those. This guy walked in. He wasn't wearing a white coat. He was dressed up a little nicer than a white coat. And he asked me a question at the end of my presentation. He said, Scott, I hear you that AT&T fiber optic ribbon is better, but how do you sell it? How would you build a business? And I realized in that moment that you can have the best technology in the world, but if you don't really know how to build a business around it, you fail. And I was like, oh my gosh, that just shattered my whole world. And so now I was like, okay, I gotta go learn business. So I went into management consulting for three years, like a lot of people do coming out of college, uh, had a great three years in that typical analyst program. And then I went back to get my MBA to try to round out the business side of me. Yeah, that's that's such an important point. I mean, great ideas are good, but they don't get you very far unless you know how to sell it. And that's not just in a business setting, but that's selling your idea to the person sitting next to you that can green light it and help you make it happen. You know, it's selling at so many different levels. And bringing people along, helping helping people understand what you're talking about and for, for them to understand it because what's obvious to you may not be obvious to them, right? And so you've got to help them understand sort of where you are. So here I was all excited about business, got an MBA and all of that. I went to Harvard uh, to get my MBA, spent a summer at uh, a Procter & Gamble, 
which is amazing at sort of understanding customers. And that really taught me that you can have the best technology and the best business in the world. But if you don't really understand customers, you fail. So then it was really all about sort of bringing for me, my career, those three circles together, right? The technology or the feasibility of something, right? The business or the viability of something, and then the customer or the desirability of something. And so that's really been what my career has been about is putting those three pieces together. And that's sort of been my journey and my, it was a great foray into innovation, even though I didn't plan it at the time for sure. Yeah. Okay, so you teed this up perfectly. Um, Scott, you are a professor at Stanford and Emory and lots of other places. Um, you teach design thinking. And so for our students who don't know what design thinking is or adults, I mean, it's not just students, what is design thinking and how do companies use it in a way to make them better? And how do students start practicing it now? Awesome. Wow. That's a question. But let me start, right? I love it. So thank you, gosh, I appreciate that. So let me start with design thinking. All design thinking really is, is a way to identify and solve a problem in a human-centered way. That's all it is, right? There's, there's all these tools out there. There's all these fancy words like empathy and prototype and iterate and all. That's great. And I love those. And we'll talk about those a little bit. But all it really is, is a way to identify and solve a problem in a human-centered way. And at the end of the day, there are three really basic principles. It's collaborative. This is a team sport. You got to work together. Number two, you use empathy to uncover those human-centered needs. You talk to people. You understand them, sometimes better than they know themselves. And then third, you prototype. You create something before you build it, right? And it's a hand sketch of an idea, or it's a quick sketch of a mobile app that you have, and it's then iterating those things over and over. So it's collaborative. It's empathetic need finding its creative problem solving. So that's sort of the basics of it. And look, you can go Google design thinking and, and uh, th there's lots of information out there um, without a doubt. And we can talk much more about that, but that's all it really is. Those are the basics. And I think that, you know, as you think about getting going in your career, don't think necessarily about, I'm gonna go have an innovation role where I'm gonna do all elements of design thinking and all of that. Start learning those different pieces. You don't have to be great at collaboration uh, you don't have to be an innovator to be great at collaboration, build up collaboration. You don't have to be in an innovation role to do empathy. Go talk to someone and ask them an open-ended question. Tell me about the last time you bought insurance. What was that like? And tell me more and ask why a lot of times. So really those for me are the basic building blocks of being an innovator is collaborative, empathetic, need finding and creative pro problem solving and prototyping. Don't feel like you have to get it all. Just start and build some of those skills. Many of you already are, I'm sure. Yeah, that's great advice. And going along with asking is listening. Totally. And really hearing what someone has to say. That is a skill. Don't interrupt, don't judge, just soak in what they are telling you so that yeah. you can put yourself in their position. And I think that's huge without a doubt. In fact, so many people listen to respond, right? To the conversation. What I would encourage us to do is actually listen to understand right? Listen to empathize. Don't just listen to respond or listen to sell, right? Which a, a lot of people do just listen to understand. And you might be surprised what you actually realize. Once you realize that you don't have the answer, you, you really, your goal is really to go find the answer and go to understand. And so I love innovators who have this seek to understand mindset where they want to learn, they want to listen, they want to watch and observe, right? Along with the listening and whatnot. And I think we can be really great if we can and identify those, if we can just listen sometimes. And it's sad that such a basic skill is so critical and probably not used as well as it should be. We could all get better at that and we need to. Yeah, I think social media has not helped. I know our students have all grown up in that world, but social media is about the response, right? There's so many ways you can interact with a post, but sometimes it's nice to just absorb. So. And just right, and just see what's out there, right? Because you're right, social media is all about the opinion that you're going to put out there, the advocacy, if you will. I'm going to advocate a point of view. I actually find that inquiring is just this amazing skill to unlock innovation. I'm not one of those people like a Steve Jobs who could just see it, right? He just saw it. He didn't do a lot of customer research. He saw it and he put it together. I'm not that way. 
I actually have to work really hard at it. And the only way I'm able to uncover these opportunities is by watching and listening and just realizing I don't have the answer. And once I realize I don't have the answer, I'm much more open to actually seeing what even the right question to ask is. He was great at seeing it, but going back to your earlier point, he was also great at selling it. Oh, without a doubt. His, so, his stories, the yeah. stories and the messaging and the, the way he put it together. I still get chills when he talked about the original iPhone. We're going to create this web device and, and, and it's going to have email on it and you're going to be able to talk on the phone and you use this as the way you <laughs> navigate it. Right? I still remember that. He was a master at that. We sound like ancient beings right now to the students watching. <laughs> I know, right, exactly. That was only like 12 years ago or something. Like I know, that. I know, right. All right, so we're talking about Steve Jobs and the development of this iPhone. Its predecessor was the iPod. Um, let's talk about product management and your experience in that. So how do you come up with this new product and how do you pr prepare yourself for a job like that? Like what are the most important parts? Yeah, great question. I didn't realize product management was a job uh, until I actually left business school and got a job in product management at Intuit. If you're familiar with Quicken, QuickBooks, TurboTax, uh, et cetera. Um, I would say my, my two thoughts on product management to get us started. One is don't think of, so many people think of product management as the product itself. That is part of it. The way I think about product management is who, what, and how. Who are you solving for? What are their needs? And how do you solve it? Right? That's the solution. But many people, when they think about product management, they think about, oh, I'm managing a product or a solution in market. Absolutely, that's true. But that's only part of it. If you don't really understand who you're solving for and what their needs are, that's not really product management to me. So that's what I would think about a lot. And I think about innovation very similarly because I have a hard time separating them because I'm a product manager innovator person. Um, but that's what I think about when I think about product management. It isn't just about what's the next feature. It isn't just about the, oh, this feature gets 47% usage. It really is about the features and how they actually solve the problem for a specific user. So I'll give you one example. Uh, if anybody's ever seen the Honda Element, it's a wonderful minivan kind of thing, uh, SUV. They designed it to solve for surfers and snowboarders because you could lift up the carpet in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the car, in the, in the utility vehicle and, and, and spray it with a hose and rinse it out. Right, that's who they designed it for. Their how was this really interesting sort of multi cross-functional vehicle that could do lots of things. And that's who they designed it for. That was the who and the what. Turns out who actually bought it was soccer moms. Because guess what? You put your kids in the car and they're muddy, right? And you want to spray that out. And so their how was pretty good, but their who and their what was off. And so what they had to do then is go back and re redo it so it could actually solve for that. And so that's what I think of product management is who, what, and how, and how those line up. And you can think about lots of products that are misaligned on the who, what, how. That's often why a lot of products fail. So interesting. I feel like we could just do an entire show on that, but <laughs> totally agree. we'll get there. Um, okay, so you mentioned innovation. Uh, one of my favorite quotes or ideas is actually from Mr. Billionaire himself, Jeff Bezos, or multi-billionaire. I'm so sorry to yeah, like yeah, I was gonna say, misrepresent don't, 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 him. Right. Yes. Um, but, you know, he. I, I appreciate what he said. He said that innovate, uh, invention is not disruptive. It's only when customers adopt whatever this invention is, is it disruptive, right? So, I feel the same way about innovation. Innovation isn't disruptive on its own. It's only when people begin to use and adopt whatever this innovative thing is or idea is that it becomes disruptive. Yeah. So could you speak more about, first of all, what the heck is innovation? Mm -hmm. And what skills make someone innovative? Yeah. And how do you hone these skills? 
Yeah, great. And I would tell you, uh, if I could count the number of organizations that have innovation in their mission statement, the number of people that have innovation in their title, it's quite overwhelming, to be completely honest with you. We'll talk about that. Yeah, it's um, simply just like a broad concept that nobody really gets. That's right. That's exactly right. And I think one of the first things you've got to do is actually define it. Everybody has a different definition. So one of the first things I do when I start at a new company is, what's our definition of innovation? For example, at Nationwide, our definition was quite simply, delight customers in solving their needs in ways they can't imagine, right? It was that, that was the goal for innovation. And so there are lots of ways to do innovation. There's technology driven, there's customer driven and design thinking, which I uh, happen to sort of really be a big fan of. There's business model innovation, right? But what really is innovation? And so define it, and there are lots of ways to define it. And I think it's very appropriate for you to ask, how do you define innovation as you all are thinking about jobs or, or networking with people um, and things like that? So that's sort of one thought. I think the second thought is this. Um, there is no magic background for innovation. The way I actually think about people like this is the shape of pi. You know pi, the, the 3.14, and other people know it better than I. Think about it that way. What great innovators are is they're broad, right? They have good breadth. Right, they've seen a handful of things. They they aren't just locked into a finance role or a uh, marketing role. They're broad, so they think broader. They have broader business experience, but then they have a couple pieces of depth, right? And that depth matters a lot. I uh, I still work with this person who had broad business. He had an MBA. He was a journalism major, right? And he actually worked in journalism. Talk about storytelling and messaging. That was one of his pieces of depth. Another piece of depth was around product management. And so what I would ask you all to think about is how do you build some breadth, but how do you actually build depth as well? Because the best innovators have both of those together. Now they don't need all of the depth. They don't need to be experts in everything. But when I put an innovator with another innovator who has some different pieces of depth, then I've got a team that actually is even stronger, a diverse team that brings different experiences. So think about how you get breadth, but also what are your areas of depth? I'll be honest with you, one of my areas of depth is product management, but before I became a product manager, it was about listening and talking to people, right? And that really showed up early in my life, right, as a kid. And so that's what I think about when you think about skills. I've seen lots of different uh, types of pie uh, uh, descriptions of people, but that's what I think about. And what my goal is as a leader is to put those people together on a team that can get to a better answer than any individual could themselves. Yeah, I mean, I also think like talking about breadth, the way to be a good leader or a good innovator is to be a generalist to some extent because you can bring people in that are the experts, right? But how do you like sort of tie all this together and think of a new way forward? Sometimes you can be limited by being too focused in one area. Right. That's right. But you can't be too only a generalist. Exactly. Right, because you need to bring what you bring, right, to whatever it is. Because I love generalists, don't get me wrong, but I need those the specific skills depending on what I'm putting them on, right? Yeah. And so it's about both, really, and building up those skills over time and figuring out what is your depth going to be. I'll tell you, it took me years to find what my depths were, but when I look back, it was, seems pretty easy. But at the time, it wasn't nearly so easy. It felt much more like a squiggly line trying to find my way in the world. Yeah. So, Scott. Given 2020 and all oh. that is and has happened and continues to happen, what has been the biggest innovation in the last year? It's a great question. Um, I would say um, for me and what I've seen, I, I would say two things. I, one, one, one personal, one business. On the personal side, kids have adapted to learning in a different environment. Not all kids and not all ages, and it's been a challenge for tons of parents and whatnot. I don't want to over, uh, I don't want to oversell that or shortcut that. But I think kids have had to be adaptable, right, in this world. And I'll be honest with you, adaptability is, a, is, is one of the most important skills that I think we all have to experience. We all know the world is moving faster. We all know the world is changing. There's many businesses who have said the trends that they were watching, accelerate, five years of trends accelerated into five months in COVID. Right. And so the adaptability is huge. And so I actually think watching the kids adapt in that I have a, a sixth grader uh, at the end of last year um, switched to, I like many, virtual school. Right. And it was hard and there were challenges and whatnot, but there were things he liked better, things he didn't like as well. And so that's been one. I think that's been one. 
I think the second big innovation for me is less of a product and it's more about how companies have realized that working from home actually can be successful, right? Because there was a, a large prevailing thought that you had to be in the office to be successful and many companies still feel that. But here's the way I think about it a little different. And, and granted, a lot of startups, as an example, honestly have always been virtual, right? In some sense, and they're showing that. Here's the way I think about it though, where I think a lot of companies are thinking about, oh, we're gonna have lots of work from home uh, people from now on, nobody's ever gonna come to the office. I actually think that's short-sighted. The work that has to happen in these companies requires different postures. And what I mean by posture, sometimes you are sitting down at your desk working on a document. Sometimes you are standing up at a whiteboard next to someone. Sometimes you're in a meeting with three or four other people trying to present. Those postures matter. And what I think we've got to do as leaders is actually design the work to take advantage of those postures, not force people into postures. Work from home, in my mind, is just another posture. We still need, from an innovation perspective, we still need those ideation sessions together on post-it notes on a whiteboard when we can safely get back together. We still need presentation. We still need to be there in person, but we also have seen the value of being there remote where meetings can actually be more effective if run well. And so I think that's the big innovation for me is the change of work and the postures that are required. I think it'll be really interesting to watch. By the way, college kids are actually used to this already. They go to, uh, they, work from, they work from home, they work with friends, they, they're out uh, you know, doing problem sets together. And it's that adaptability. A lot of uh, sort of people, once they graduate, they go to their desk and they sit down and they work for 25 years. That's not the reality. And I think that COVID has accelerated that. So that for me is the innovation that I'm excited to watch is how does work and work posture change uh, coming out of this crazy craziness? So it's um, not necessarily innovation. Well, it's innovation um, at work, but not necessarily around usual behaviors. Like these are behaviors that people have and now we're taking advantage of how people naturally are. That's right. And in fact, I love I love the way you said it. Those, those natural behaviors. The way that the, the corporate world has really worked over the last couple of decades is you adjust to the space around you. Where I actually want is the flip of that, where the space adjusts to you and how you need to work in that given moment. That I think will be interesting. We've heard of open offices, we've heard of you know collaboration spaces, all those things. It's not about the most amazing, wow, this is an amazing open space. It's about how that space enables you to do the different types of work you need to do. And I think we need to take advantage of that. And employers need to really lean into that and figure out what that really looks like to make our people be more successful and happier. Yeah. So it's no longer an open office concept. It's the adaptive space concept. That's exactly right. And if you no, could we coined that, it here. Right. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Adaptability, right? Adaptive space. I think that's huge. Yeah. Okay. So Scott, are there really truly new ideas or do we just keep recycling the same ones over and over again? Yeah. Um, here's what I would say. I believe that the base needs aren't changing a lot. We have a need for social interaction. We have a need to exchange goods and services with, with money tra transforming hands. I think two things are happening though. One is our level of, um, expectation for how simple and easy those things are continues to go up. Call it the Amazon effect, call it the Google effect, right? The bar for simplicity continues to go up. I remember thinking to myself as this engineer who could talk, I'm going to go out to Silicon Valley and I spent 12 years there. I'm going to go out to Silicon Valley. I'm going to make computers as easy as turning on a light switch, right? Never quite got there, but the bar continues to go up. So how we solve these needs has to continue to get better and better. That's one. I think secondly, as technology continues to advance, right, we can do more and more things that we could never do. I'll give you an example. Uber, everybody talks about Uber, specifically the Uber car service, right? Uber didn't really solve a different problem. Taxis were solving a problem of taking you from point A to point B, right? Guess what Uber does? It takes you from point A to point B, right? So the need is very, very similar. What I think Uber did really well is two things. One, they put it all on your cell phone, right? So you can just sort of say, I'm here. But the biggest thing I think they did um, is actually leveraging the network of people so that your point A didn't have to be a hotel where taxis group. Your point A could be anywhere you were, 
right? So the need is very similar, but Uber did a brilliant job of bringing that together, leveraging other people's vehicles and creating a network where the A's and the B's could be much more variety, could be much more spread out than others. That being said, I think there's tons of innovation out there. I see it everywhere. I see it in FinTech. I see it in insurance. Uh, I see it in every area I look for. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, if you, you might know this. Uh, name what year this person said this. This person who was the head uh, of the US Patent Office said everything that has ever been invented, everything that will ever be invented has already been invented. Any guesses as to what year that was? I'm going to say it was like in the 60s. Not bad. 1896. <laughs> Right? Oh, so off. So close. Right. But that's the thing. I think we can't imagine. And that's one of the challenges with innovation is if you go ask people, Kashi, what do you want? They can't really tell you. That's why you have to use that listening skill that we talked about, that observation to unlock what we call latent needs, things that they can't tell you, but are absolutely there. And that's what I'm excited about as we build this next generation of innovators. How can they see things that the rest of us can't using these powers of observation and listening? That's what I get excited about. There's plenty of innovation out there, plenty of ideas. The trick is, like we talked about earlier, it's not just about the idea, it's about implementing and getting the idea adopted and actually solving the problem. Yeah, so that brings up a good question. How do you balance the need to come up with something really creative with the need to come up with something really functional or useful? So I don't know that, that I actually, I would argue that don't spend your time coming up with something that's super creative don't spend your time coming up with something that sounds really great. Don't spend your time coming up with something that people are like, oh, that's cool, but then would never use, right? Spend your time solving problems, right? There are countless examples of innovations that sounded great. We call it innovation theater, right? It sounds really, really good. By the way, did you know it's been the year of Bitcoin for about eight years now, right? That was a really cool sounding thing. But what problem does it solve? And a bunch of people are going to get mad at me because of that. I, it's an awesome technology. does really great, uh, especially blockchain underneath, solving for ledgers and contracts and whatnot. But again, it's not about does it sound cool? There's not some absolute value of the word innovation. It's does it solve a problem? And that for me is the, the goal of what it should be. I, we came up, I've come up with a number of things that uh, with teams that are really, really good to solve a problem. They don't sound that exciting, but they're transformational in people's lives. And at the end of the day, that's what I think we have to have a goal to. Mm. Yeah. All right. We have a lot of questions coming in from students about innovation. Um, Tony wants to know, do you use a process to come up with your ideas? Great question. Um, yes. In fact, I would argue, and this may sound counterintuitive, that the best innovation processes have a rigor behind them. They're structured enough, they're rigorous enough. The process I love to use is design thinking, right? Design thinking starts with empathy, going out and really understanding people, defining then the problem of what you're solving, ideating, prototype test, and then iterating again. So I like to use something structured like that. Otherwise, you're just throwing ideas at the dark. There are lots of processes out there and there's no magic necessarily to the five steps I just shared. But it goes back for me with starting with empathy and understanding people and then going through that. The biggest thing I would tell you is that so many people think of innovation as the idea. Shoot, in fact, the I think the icon for most innovation is a light bulb. <laughs> I would tell you that's half of the battle. Half of the battle is solving the problem the right way. The other half is solving the right problem. And that's where empathy and define come in. You've got to define the need and you won't get there at the beginning. You'll have to get there through iteration, but that's the methodology I try to go through. Said another way, I try not to jump to solution too quickly. I try to understand people and understand the needs uh, as much as I can. And then I start to bridge off of that to ideas because I might love an idea, but if it's not solving a problem I have, or it's not for me, I'm not a very good judge of what, whether that, that idea is good or not. I love that. It's like asking the right question, right? It is. Um, okay. I could ask you a lot of questions about that, but we'll talk about that another time. Um, this seems like this goes along with this question. Ronnie wants to know, do you get better ideas from brainstorming with a group or by yourself? Awesome. Great question. Short answer is both. And what I mean by that is so many people, when they think about brainstorming, they think about, let's all get together. Let's get a post-it post notes. Let's get on a wall and let's do it. Love it. 
I would tell you the reason sort of group interaction works great is because you the goal of ideation is to build on top of ideas, right? And I often don't have the best idea. Very few people on my team have the best idea from the beginning. We get there by laddering on top. That's one part. But the other half is there are different types of people out there, right? That sort of all together is a very extroverted activity. We actually find that so many of the best innovators are introverted and that sort of that's uncomfortable. So what we try to do as we sort of lead teams is we give them a few minutes to think to themselves, right? One on one and introverts are amazing at thinking about really creative ideas. And then we get up at the whiteboard and then we ladder on top and we might sit down again. And so we honestly modulate between the roles of together and individual. Neither one for me is good by itself. You really need the combination of the two but you need the combination of the two. So I would encourage teams to do both of them and be really intentional about when you're in one mode versus when you're in another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. A great question. Uh, Mandy, I'd like to know, does teaching take time away from thinking about your day job? <laughs> so wonderful question. And I have to ask my former bosses whether I was, no. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's a whole nother thing. Now, here's what I would say. I love to teach. Um, it's, it's a passion of mine. What I would tell you, though, is I'm a, a person who believes that the combination of learn, do, and teach is a powerful combination. Said another way, I do my day job, and then it helps me be a better teacher. But when I teach, it helps me be a better a doer because I'm learning along the way. And so actually, they work really well complementary together for me. Um, and they both make me better. And, and the organizations I've been at over the years have valued that. The other thing they valued is because I also teach, I can do that within the company too, but I can actually build up more skills on our team, uh, on our teams that actually helps the organization. So at Nationwide, as much as I was the chief innovation officer, I actually thought of myself almost more as the chief innovator officer because part of my goal, and I actually get more scale out of focusing on innovators even more than innovations. Now, not everybody can do that, but what you can do is make sure you put in place in, in places in your career, the ability to learn and even teach. There's this wonderful book uh, that Noel Tishy wrote on the teachable point of view. His idea was that everybody has something to teach. If they form it into a teachable point of view, a 15 minute, here's a couple slides, here's a little talk. You can teach something. I would just encourage everybody to teach your, your teachable point of view on a few things and you'll build up more over time. And in so teaching, you get better at doing, which I think is where the magic really is. I love that chief innovator instead of chief innovation. It, there is a difference. For there's sure. a difference. Both um, matter, but there's a difference. And I think that, you know, innovation is about enabling the people and the teams around you. A lot of people think it's about the idea. And Scott, do you like this idea? Do you hate this idea? I don't know. What the team think? As the team talk to the customer, what did they think? And so it's more about people than it is the thing for me. Yeah, and it's almost like you need to turn it into a verb because it is an action. It's not something, you know? Right. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, Ebony wants to know, why is innovation important? Awesome. It's funny, right? Because it's, we're in this wave, this buzzwordy ways, way where <laughs> people are like, it's all about innovation. The funny thing is, it's always been about that. Like if you sort of demystify the word innovation, you go back to where we started, right? Delighting customers and solving their needs or you know, uh, empathetic need finding, whatever the, the right definition is, it continues to be about understanding people and giving them products and services and solutions that change their lives. I think what has changed is our discipline around innovation has gotten better, right? Which is good, but the world seems to be moving faster. The world is a more connected place. And so, you know, you've heard, I'm sure the only constant is change. And so where a organization could launch a product a year or every couple of years in a big way and coast that for a while, that's not true anymore. We have, we had this saying at, uh, at first data, believe it or not, from a customer perspective, we called it quick it or quit it. What that basically meant is if you didn't quickly give them value, they're gone, right, as a customer. And so I think the pace of change has gotten uh, much, much higher. I think people are feeling that, companies are feeling that. As a result, this discipline around innovation, was it, which isn't really marketing, it isn't really finance, it isn't really uh, product management per se, it's sort of all of them together, 
um, I think really matters. And so one of the things we've got to do is instead of organizing in those functions per se, we've got to bring them all together to solve those customer needs. So I think it's just customer expectations and the pace of change that has made this thing called innovation a much deeper discipline than it's been before. Uh, but again, I don't want to, I don't want, I, I like to demystify it because it really is just about listening and adapting and changing and making things better as opposed to this, oh, he or she is a creative type. He or she is an innovative type, right? We need all types of people doing this type of work. So interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, th again, like, is this really a new thing? It's not, it's just repackaged in a different way. Right. And um, consulting companies make a lot of money with new repackages, of those things, which <laughs> is why right. I like to demystify it back to the basics, right? Because we all need to be doing this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jim wants to know, how do you validate that your ideas are good? Awesome. Or not. Yeah, great. So um, I would tell you, I start by looking at them and then I quickly realize I don't know the answer. The short answer is I get them out to my customers and test them, right? Or my future customers, right? And I don't test them, like let's say I'm doing a mobile app, right? Let's say I wanna do a mobile app. I don't build the app and then take it and say, what do you think? I start with a very quick low fidelity prototype. I'll draw a couple images, if you will, of what a screenshot could look, or what a couple screenshots could look like, hand drawn. And I will take that out to people uh, who ideally are my target customer and I'll get feedback. They'll tell me things they like, they'll tell me things they don't like, Right. And I try to do that. And then that helps me understand I am the worst judge of whether an idea is good or not. You are probably the worst judge of whether an idea is good or not. It's your customer that is the authority, that user, that human, that's the authority. So rather than wait till you've built it and then show it to them, show it to them as early as possible. And you might be surprised. For example, I was uh, I was right now a lot of innovations happening in schools right now. I've been teaching at K through 12 areas. And by the way, if a five year old can do design thinking, I think anybody can. By the way, the, the words we use on the five year old is ask and make. Right. Ask is listen. Right. Ask some questions. Make is prototype. Right. So ask and make. You can do that, too. I promise. But um, I did. You know, one of the things I was fascinated with in this remote learning is what if you would redesign Zoom? to actually really optimize for remote learning, right? What would that look like? For example, in Zoom, everybody's equal. But in a classroom, you have a teacher and then you have the students. What if you, so I did a super quick sketch by hand and we pre, I prototyped it and tested it with my, my family. Another a colleague of mine did it with his family and we got some fast feedback and we learned Zoom does okay, but it misses a couple of places. So very quickly, I was able to get good feedback and insights in the matter of a, a half of a day. And then that helped me understand that there were some elements of my idea that were good. There were some that were not, by the way, so we stopped working on those. And we'll see, I don't know if we'll turn that into anything, but the idea being the best judge of your idea is your user. So talk to them as soon as you can, show them some ideas and get their feedback, but listen to their feedback and don't go in thinking you're right, because guess what you'll hear? They'll validate it even if they didn't say that they validated it, right? You need to really be open to listening again and if they say they hate it, great, awesome. You just learned a lot. Yeah, you'll always find what you're looking for. Always, always, always. Too many people do that. <laughs> um, uh, Alicia wants to know, what's the best idea you've ever had? Wow. Um, best idea I've ever had. And, and I will say my team ever had. Um, I will tell you, a number of years ago, and this may be, I hope this isn't too far away from where everybody is. But a number of years ago, there, you know, you, you talk about the, the new thing, right, blockchain. A handful of years ago, it was all about mobile wallets, right? Mobile wallet, mobile wallet, mobile wallet. It was going to be the year of mobile wallet. Um, and I had a, a, a head of product come to me and said, I want you, this was when I first data, I want you to build me a great mobile wallet because we can put payments in phones. Okay. So we went out and talked to customers. Guess what? There's not a big problem with that credit card swipe in a non-COVID world, right? The credit card works pretty darn well, right? What we learned as we went out though, we sat in the back of SUVs and drive-throughs, by the way, we went with families to restaurants, to the gas station, et cetera, and we watched and we observed. And what we found, the problem wasn't in the payment. The problem was in waiting in line. If you've ever gone through a drive-through with little kids in the car, it's an excruciating experience, right? And so we said, what if, Instead of innovating mobile wallet, 
what if we actually innovate commerce? And what if we think about, yeah, payments in there, but what about other things like order ahead? What about things like uh, coupons? What about things like um, uh, loyalty points and things like that? Long story short, we created a new category uh, for First Data called Universal Commerce. We piloted with uh, companies like Chick-fil-A and Burger King and Taco Bell and others. Uh, and that idea of order ahead really came out of the team that we had at First Data and Universal Commerce has become a big business line for First Data, which is amazing. And so for me, it's a really good example and, and it's taken off from there. Now we just live with it and you know the delivery has been a godsend, I think, for a lot of people uh, during the COVID time. But it wasn't framed by innovating payments. It was framed by innovating the problem around it, which was waiting in line, and how do you actually solve for that? So that for me is one of the proud ideas that the team came up with and it turned into something that people adopted, uh, which was different than the, the, the head of product wanted it to be. But you got to believe he was pretty thrilled uh, when we came up with, with uh, that yeah, idea and then launched it. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Casey wants to know, are you artistic? <laughs> Um, so many people, when they think about innovative or creativity, it's can you draw? I cannot. I'm ter <laughs> I'm the king of stick figures. I really I, like. I'm, I'm. But guess what? Stick figures are amazing. I am envious of people who can draw and who are artistic and whatnot. What I realized uh, growing up is I was a pretty creative kid, right? I would, you know, lots of working with my hands, putting things together. I would draw paintings. They weren't good, to be clear. Like my mom even. My mom didn't even say they're great, right? Just to be clear. But what I what school did for me is it sort of beat that creativity out of me. But later in life, when I was, I don't know, 30, I started to rediscover innovation and I rediscovered creativity. So if you would have asked me when I was uh, 29, whether I was I artistic, I would have said no. If I would answer you now, am I artistic in the in the typical sense where I draw beautiful paintings and I really appreciate uh, uh, art of all kinds and I go to museums? Uh, that's not me either but I can use art to help me innovate. I can be creative to creatively identify a need. I can be creative in how do you identify and talk to a person. And so for me, artistry or artism is a key part of what we do. It just looks a little different for me than the typical definition looks like. Well, art is subjective. So, you know, you are an artist in your own way. There you go. There you go. Um, Brendan wants to know, when do you get your best ideas? Awesome. Um, what I have learned about myself is that I need to, we talked about those postures earlier, right? I need to create multiple moments over the course of a number of days. It's not why, sometimes I get them in the shower, of course, right? But more importantly for me, I need to create multiple moments, right? Some moments where I'm doing nothing, right? Some moments where I'm working really hard. Some moments when I'm doing uh, something very uh, menial that I can go on autopilot. Sometimes I go for a walk, a wander walk, where I start to wander about things and whatnot. And so for me, I need many moments and I need the ability for multiple moments over time to iterate those ideas along the way. So there isn't one place that I really go to. I'm like, oh my God, I'm stuck. Let me go here. It's really multiple moments where I allow an idea to percolate, right? Uh, sometimes when I'm thinking about it, sometimes when I'm not, that is for me how I get to better ideas. I think it might be different for everyone. So I would say, you know, what's the thing, what's the area where you get those uh, and, and pay attention to that over time. I would tell you, I didn't have that lens earlier in my career. Now I'm trying to build in time and moments where I can create that space to do it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last question, because uh, we're quickly running out of time, as always. Um, Rianne wants to know, what are your favorite books? Oh, I want to assume about innovation, but any of them. Yeah, awesome. So um, I'm going to give you uh, two, I'm going to give you four, two sort of businessy creative books, right? Without a doubt. I love Design Thinking Your Life, which was put together by a group of people at Stanford, uh, where a lot of design thinking came together about how do you actually use these tools to design what your life is, right? Love mm -hmm. that book. The other book I really love is Creative Confidence. Uh, Creative Confidence is a great book written by the founders of IDEO, world-class design thinking consulting firm who founded the D School. And it really is about, uh, you know, building your confidence and your creativity or artistry. I love those. Two other ones I love, though, to go the opposite end, Rosie Revere, the engineer, right? It is a kid's book, right? But what it talks about is how do you create the perfect first try? 
and I go read it. I love, and that for me is magical. It's not about putting the final paper or problem set together, right? That gets you an A. It's about what is your perfect first try that actually helps, right? And I think that's key. So that for me is another book. I think the the um, the other book I am uh, I love is the Most Magnificent Thing, which is another kids book. And really, what it talks about is I tried this and that didn't work. I tried this. And that didn't work. I tried this and that didn't work. And then I tried this. And so it really talks about iteration and evolving and being okay with that. And so again, two adult books, two kids book, both are powerful. And I would tell you, if you only have a few minutes, go look at the kids book, Rosie Revere, the engineer and the most magnificent thing. The lessons there are amazing for things I think innovators need to carry with them. Yeah. And I think that's a great point that you're pointing out kids books for adults because Sometimes kids are closer to the way we should be thinking, right? right? So there is value in listening to your children or the, the children around of you. A child. The mindset of a child is a, it's one of the most powerful things you can tap into as an innovator. I think we've lost that. We need to get that back. Yeah, absolutely. What a great point. All right. Well, everyone, we need to thank Scott and uh, give him a round of applause. We're so happy that he joined us today. I know I know you guys have a lot more questions. Put them in the comments and we'll get them over to him. Um, find us on the web, uh, supernovacommencements.com. I think you guys know that already. We're um, hashtag supernovacommencements all over the web as well. Drop us a comment. Let us know what you're up to. Um, we've got some exciting opportunities, so make sure you sign up for the mailing list. Those are gonna be going out shortly, grants, scholarships, internships. Uh, Scott, do you have any closing thoughts for our students? Here's my last thought, right, which is this. Think about your career not as, I'm gonna do this, then I learn something, then I do this, and then I do that, that's part of it. The other part of it is at the end of every day, at the end of every week, at the end of every month, at the end of every project, whatever the right cadence is, Reflect and learn. What did you learn about yourself? I had this mentor who said, if you can name it, you can tame it. And what I love about that is it was basically this, look, that last month, I did good here, I didn't do as good here. And by naming both of those, you can make one stronger and then start to mitigate the other. So just reflect and learn at the end of every project or, or month or whatnot, because the way we get better is partly by having new experiences, but it's also partly by reflecting in ourselves and building ourselves up and making ourselves better. Don't, don't ever stop investing in yourself. Mm, great advice. Great parting thoughts from Scott. Okay, so everyone, next week, our guest is Aretta Baumgartner. Um, she was rescheduled from earlier in the year when uh, we had a power outage in Atlanta and things were crazy. So um, she is at the Center for Puppetary Arts. She's the education director. So we're gonna be talking about puppets and storytelling and all kinds of great things. So join us. Students have a great week. Make the most of this unique time. Use it to your advantage. And remember, it's a blessing to be a blessing. So be kind as you go through your day today. Stay safe and healthy. And we'll see you next week. Bye.